This is episode 63 with adventurer, filmmaker, illustrator, writer, and creator, Brendan Leonard. Welcome to Wild Ideas Worth Living, an adventure podcast presented by REI Co-op, the brand who helps get you outside through gear, classes, and adventures. We talk to experts who have taken a wild idea and made it a reality so you can too. From people who have climbed the tallest peaks, started thriving businesses, and even broken records, some of the wildest ideas can lead to the most rewarding adventures. I'm your host, Shelby Stanger, and I hope you enjoy this show. Brendan Leonard is the creator of Semirad. He's also an author, adventurer, illustrator, filmmaker, and an all-around interesting guy. He's biked across America, ridden through the Grand Canyon on a raft, and walked across it twice, lived out of a converted van for three years, and climbed and adventured in the mountains all around the West. He's all about showcasing the joy that comes from adventures for the every man and woman, meaning you listening, and he just made a movie presented by REI called How to Run 100 Miles, where he did a giant 100-mile ultra race. He gets paid to not only write and do amazing adventures, but he recently started creating humor cartoons and getting paid to do them even though he's never been trained as an artist. This episode is chock full of gems and wisdom from an everyday guy making it happen in a major way. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. We should just start with your latest movie, How to Run 100 Miles, that you recently did, presented by REI. For those of you listening, if you haven't seen it, this is a great movie Brendan made with his best friend, and it's really more than just running 100 miles. Uh, yeah, hopefully people will see it if they haven't. Uh, boy, uh, I would never try to do both of those things at the same time again. Uh, this is my first 100-mile ultra marathon, and uh, first film of that size, like... Um, just budget wise and like knowing where it's going to go. Cause REI sponsored it. Um, and it's difficult to try to, you know, you're still a quote unquote a director while you're running. And like, not only do you have to survive the thing, cause like if you don't make it to the finish line, the story is kind of not as good, you know? Um, so there's that pressure. And then you're like, we got to get the shot at the end. We got to get the finish line. Yeah. You know, and you're worried about all these things and, you know, uh, my good friend Forrest Woodward was, I said, can you just come for like three or four days and shoot the race, you know, and, and he ended up being more of a director of photography and he's always pushing to, you know, get, you know, as much coverage as possible. And he goes, I think you should take out your iPhone a lot during the race and record diaries of how you guys are doing. And I was like, okay, well, we're going to need a schedule. So I set an alarm on my phone to go Smart. off every hour and every hour I would pull my phone out. So those shots are just from your iPhone. Yeah. Wow. Well, the, the iPhone shoots 4k. So yeah. people like, if people are like, you know, how do I make a movie? I'm like, you have a really awesome camera in your pocket. If you're, if you have an expensive cell phone like that. Um, so yeah, and it does pretty well. And like in that situation, you're not looking to like get great cinematography. It's just like, here's a moment, here's how we feel. And you can, if you watch all 30 some of these in succession you're just like these guys are just falling apart you know like it's like positive for like 12 hours and it's just like you know like hitting the wall um so that was like mentally taxing fairly fairly mentally taxing and I still get done and I'm like I should have shot more footage of this like we don't have you know whatever it's, yeah you always go you back you and do. you wish you could have done something else is there do you have any stories like behind the stories of shooting that you could share um boy you know, we we spent a lot, a lot of time trying to shoot. The, I shot, I think, 13 hours of footage of Jason and I training. So Jason is, for uh, those yeah. of you who don't know, is, is his partner that we he trained with, his best friend, right? One yeah, of his best friends. Yeah, one of my best friends. I've known him for 18 years. Awesome. And it's kind of, the film to me was kind of being able to, I always think, I wish everybody had a friend like Jason. And uh, if... If I could, I get sick of telling people about him. So I'm like, here, I'll just make a movie and then I can just send people the link, you know. It's like having a mini Tony Robbins as your best friend. Yes, exactly. awesome. You know what's funny is he goes to a lot of Tony Robbins. I knew it. Uh, He's great. Anyway, he's uh, probably the source of the most motivation for me to accomplish things in life for the past 18 years. And so it's about his story, metaphorically told through us trying to run 100 miles. So there's like bromance, but also, you know, he... 
grew up in a really rough environment. His um, father was abusive, uh, so his mom divorced his dad. He emptied the checking account, so the mom had to like try to figure out how to raise six children on her own. Um, so they had a really rough time growing up. He was dyslexic, got bullied because he was dyslexic, so then he learned how to fist fight, and he's not a big guy. He's still maybe, I think he's five seven and a half on a in a in a pair of running shoes. So um, one of the stories in the film that we tell really briefly is how he got, somebody hassled him one morning in middle school, and he, and he had to jump up to put the kid in a headlock, like literally <laughs> jump, and then just uh, took the kid out. And from then on, he was, he was like, wow, I got, I got respect. You know, I wasn't getting bullied. And then anyway, his story goes on. He, um, you know, put himself through college, blah, 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 all this stuff. And he's inspirational in this way to me. So I wanted to tell his story. And the worst part about that is I have to be in the movie to tell a story and I hate being on camera. So. Really? But you're so good at it. And then I you also disagree. had to train to run a hundred miles. Yes. Also that. So, which is harder, the training part than maybe actually you had to run how many miles before you even ran the hundred miles, like 1600, 12, 1200, 1200 roughly miles. over six months. Yeah. So it was like 1200 miles and 175,000 feet of elevation gain for me to train for that. And did you grow up running? Uh, I ran, I was a sprinter in high school um, in a small town in Iowa. So I, like 200 was as far as I could run 200 meters. And like my coach put me in the 400 a couple times and I was like, I can't do this. I'm dying at like 300 meters. I can't, you know. So any tricks or tips to running a hundred miles? Um, I think, you know, you look up these training programs. Well, okay. So we started by doing a 50 K and then, a, and then a 50 mile race and another 50 mile race. So this whole process took me two years so to you get to skipped the marathon training. I did a marathon like 10 years ago and that, it was like, their marathons tend to be on streets and it doesn't really prepare you super well. Personally for me, it doesn't prepare me super well for trail running ultra marathons because you're not dealing with like rocks and roots and steep climbs and steep descents and stuff like that. So I run in, in town during the week and then I will go out of Denver to a trail to do the, the big long runs where you're doing like your 20, 25 mile run to train for a hundred. Um, so yeah, like, but you know, like you, you're not running the whole time. So I think of it as like when I was like, oh, I might get into ultra running. Could I do it? I think, oh, well, I did like rim to rim in the Grand Canyon in a day. And that was like 24 miles, you know, and it's a big day, but you're not running the whole time. I'm like, well, okay, that's, that's close to an ultra, you do know, you sleep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to. So yeah. you did sleep in the hundred mile. I, I oh, no, like, no, no, we didn't. didn't no, no. Okay. Yeah. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. So you did 100 miles without sleeping. Yeah, but you have to, otherwise you'll never finish. And, like, I think it'd be worse if you laid down in the middle of it. Like, we wouldn't, we weren't fast enough where we had, we wouldn't have had time to sleep, you know. I, I'm curious. So you not only run, but you're a rock climber. You do all sorts of outdoor activities. Like, how did you get into out, the outdoors? Um, you know, I learned to ski a little bit growing up. I grew up in Iowa, and my, my parents had enough money. I think it was like three years or four years in a row we'd come out to Colorado and do a little skiing. Like, And that was – and I'd been maybe two trips to Colorado in the summer. One trip to Colorado in the summer, done a little tiny bit of hiking, and I really didn't do much outdoors until I, I actually went to um, rehab for uh, substance abuse when I was 23, so I was alcoholic. I got arrested a bunch of times and right after that I moved to Montana and it was like this thing where people went hiking and kayaking and skiing and everything. And that's where I started kind of getting into the mountains and doing a little bit of peak bagging. And, um, right after grad school at the university of Montana, I learned how to rock climb and I did that primarily for about six or seven years. Um, nice. and you just kind of do other things. Cause like one thing is I've not, I wasn't going to get good at rock climbing. I wasn't going to get that good. So to learn some backcountry skiing, do some backpacking, getting into like bike packing. Brendan's pretty humble. I've heard he's really good at all these sports. I'm not. Um, that is, a, that is, that I is wanna... false. You, you're a journalist. You should actually not. <laughs> fake news. Yeah, um, that is fake news. Um, so I want to get back into addiction because I think a lot of people struggle with addiction. I've had several people on the podcast who are sober. Maybe you could just talk a little bit about about addiction and sort of how you overcame it through the outdoors. I know you wrote a book on it. 
Yeah. I can't wait to read it. Yeah, I guess, you know, like, I'm not really sure what, like, scientifically is what happens. You know, I think, like, people will say maybe you have an addictive personality. And I kind of do do things, like, kind of all the way or not at all. And I think that might be kind of what I was doing with drinking when I was 17, 18, through 23 years old, where it was like, you know, you think other people are doing the same things you are, but you're the only one getting arrested and getting thrown out of bars and like having the real problems. Um, and I think I've kind of done that with everything else in life. It's just been healthy things, you know, like they're productive. Now it's always creative things or things in the outdoors, you know, like if we're going to do something, let's do something big, you know? Um, and I'm not sure it's different for everybody, but for me, it was just like, you know, how do you quit this? And like, well, you make it the first day without taking a drink and then you make it the second day. And, you know, now I'm on like, you like 16 years next month. And it's Good like, for you. yeah. And it's like, but you, you just finished the job, right? You don't like, oh, I've been pretty good about it, you know? And then, and then I had a beer last Saturday and now I'm having six beers and next week I'm going to have 12 and then I'm going to be in jail again. And like it was at the time the situation was like, if I got caught being in a bar while I was on probation for a year, I would go to jail for like six months. And like, I was in jail for like a week and I was like, you know, no offense, but this is not for me. I can't really, <laughs> this is not cool. I'm not having a good time in here. So it was to the thought of going for like, plus I think, you know, uh, you know, you were in a position where it was, there was no flexibility left. It wasn't like, Oh yeah, my boss fired me. Cause I was late. It was like, you go, you run into the cops. You don't really, they don't really negotiate. You know, they're not like, you're not like, Oh yeah. Hey guys, this is a huge misunderstanding. I'm not supposed to be here. They're like, what are you talking about? You're under arrest. Get in, you know, you're in jail, go, you know? And it was like, okay, this is a wake up call. So that ended that for me. And you just, I don't know if every other addict does this, but you just kind of move on to something else. And it's been very healthy for me. So you drew kind of a bright line, which I think is pretty healthy. You have to do that sometimes in life with things that aren't serving you. Um, I've drawn bright lines in my life over things that weren't serving me. And, and it's not like you can tiptoe back over the line. It's like, there's a line. (laughs) Some people do that. And like, you know, there's, there's, Yeah, a lot of people can just, like my girlfriend will drink half a glass of wine at dinner, and there's a line in Chris Rock's movie, Take Five, which or uh, Top Five, which uh, is actually, he, it's about, he's an alcoholic, and he actually meets, you know, it's about other things, but Rosario Dawson's character is also an alcoholic, and they have this conversation, and he's like, I see people leave, like, half a glass of wine on a table in a restaurant, I'm like, how the fuck do you do that? <laughs> and then that's, that's what I think, too. I'm like, you ready to go? And I see all this wine left in the glass, and I'm like... Oh my God, what, what is, I don't understand at all. Like I cannot fathom that, you know? Wow. That's awesome. Actually, yeah. I'm kind of a half a glass of wine wonder as well myself. So you can do that. Yeah. I, so I we're can, on two different planets that's, right now. But I will finish my glass of wine, but it, I only fill it halfway because I'm ah, drunk okay. after half. Yeah. But no, I can't leave like a cookie uneaten or yeah. like a, or a row of Oreos. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know. <laughs> I might leave a row of Oreos, but, um, you know, I think what's so cool is you're a storyteller for a living now and you've managed to create your own path of storytelling, but you are really good at bringing humor to darkness Mm. and and it's cool. It's this irreverent, you have this really good irreverent, but lighthearted personality. What stories do you like to tell the most? Oh boy. I think it being funny is like a fallback for me because it's like the easiest because I've been trying to do it so hard for like, my, I'm th- I just turned 39 and I, I remember being like four and five years old and listening to my, my mom's brothers, Dan and Steve, my uncles, and then like the other, my mom was, you know, grew up six brothers and sisters in a big Irish Catholic family and they get together and they just total goofballs, storytellers. And it's not even like these extravagant stories about traveling the world. It's just like funny stuff. And I remember being like five years old thinking, one day I'm going to make my Uncle Steve laugh or my Uncle Dan. Like, I'm going to be the funny one. Awesome. And I try, probably tried for 10 years until like one time they actually laughed at one of my jokes. And I was like, there we go. Do you remember the joke? I don't. I have no idea. It was probably some stupid little like 13-year-old kid joke, though, you know. Well, what's great is now you have, okay, so you have Semi-Rad, your blog, which mm-hmm. everyone should definitely check out. It's called semi-rad.com. Brandon started how many years ago? 2011. 2011. February February 2011. Good so. for you. Yeah. It's been going on for seven years. 
And and also now your Instagram at semi dash rad has illustrations, almost like satires of everyday life, the outdoors, and more. Mm-hmm. So I think the latest one is band T-shirts from oh yeah from when, from when you were sixteen and from, when you're well seventeen and when you're thirty seven. So there's two pictures: band T-shirts when you're seventeen, and then next to it is the same band T-shirt T-shirt when you're thirty seven. Yeah, I love that because you're wearing the same band T-shirt. I, whatever age yeah 13 is that wait it was like the band you like when you're 16 you're still wearing the t-shirt when 20 years later and because you can buy the t-shirts still and like there's this whole there's all these studies about music and how you you develop your musical tastes in your teens and because it's like this most formative period of your of your life and emotionally and and you it's a really hard to find music after you turn 32 actually it's been proven And, and i'm going through that right now and i'm like buying all these old t-shirts of like hip-hop groups of when i was like you know 15 16 like what was your jam uh like i just bought a public enemy hoodie you know that it's great and a de la soul stakes is high t-shirt which was what that joke was about i was just like i was on twitter and somebody was like de la soul stakes is high t-shirts back in stock and i'm like it's like i don't even have any control i just like i don't think this of this is money it just disappears i'm like great it'll be at my house in a week cool um so yeah. So I want to get into these illustrations because yeah, because right now you have a ton of followers on Instagram. You do these illustrations that that actually have meaning. They're almost like editorial cartoons, and you just said, and you're getting paid to now be an illustrator, but you're not trained as an artist at all. No, but I got um. So I was I would do every once in a while I would like draw a chart in like a field notes notebook and then take a photo of it and put it on Instagram. This is like two years ago, and they were the first one I ever did was. My friend Sid and I were sitting in this diner in, in Manhattan, and I said, what do you, like, the, the person seating us said, uh, you know, do you, do you guys want a booth or a table? And we go, booth, and we sat down. And I go, what percentage of people do you think actually don't, like, prefer, prefer tables over booths? And yeah, Sid goes, zero, zero. <laughs> no, you know, he said 100. So I drew a pie chart, and it was like, it, the, the pie chart was literally called, percentage of Americans who prefer booths to tables, according to my friend Sid Jones. And it was just completely black. And, and I thought it was so funny. And I started doing a few more of those. And then uh, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to buy an iPad and start drawing on an iPad. And um, this guy I know who has a greeting card company called Hello Happiness Greeting Cards. And I, I'm just, cool. I just know him through Facebook. And I hit him up. And I was like, Josh, what do you use? And he said, well, I use the iPad Pro with this with the Apple Pencil, which is a Bluetooth pencil, like a stylus and i use this program called procreate that's what i an app and i was like okay and i went to the apple store and was like well it's like 1200 bucks for all this stuff i'm like you know what i gotta try this yeah so and that was december 2016 i was like told myself i'm gonna do three of these illustrations a week until something happens or i get sick of it and it's been super fun it was just like this i was kind of bored with instagram a little bit like looking at you know, everybody's photos are cool and everything, but it kind of got to be the same thing. And yep. maybe that's just me being lazy and not finding new people to follow. But who I was following was like cartoonists. Like I kept finding ones and it was like, you get to this point where your feed is just like all cartoons and like golden retrievers. And I'm like, this is great. I love Instagram, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, well, okay. And some of these people are professional cartoonists, but they will just post like some crappy sketches they drew in like 15 seconds. I'm like, okay, that's not that great of a drawing. Maybe I can do something that's also not that great of a drawing and maybe it'll take off. And really it's just a visual manner of telling a joke, you know, and you're like, okay. Or saying this thing about like, don't, you know, we all experience this thing. How can I relay this in like graphic format? And it's, it's you know. It's kind of Seinfeld-esque. I oh, love maybe, it. yeah, okay, yeah. No, it is, it's so it's, good. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's pretty smart. So I'm curious, what cartoonists do you follow on Instagram? That, that maybe I could follow as well. I was going to do a post about this, but a lot of the New Yorker cartoonists, uh, Steinberg, Avi Steinberg, is he's a kindergarten teacher in Brooklyn. Oh, cool. And he does, you know, they all just submit cartoons to the New Yorker, and lots of them get rejected, but a lot of them get in. Steinberg's awesome. Um, Have you submitted your cartoons to New no, Yorker? No, no, no. I can't, there's no way. Like, it's not even close. Like, they're, I think you these, people, these people are it's like dare. heroes. <laughs> Uh, Ellis Rosen is another one. There's a guy called Jake Likes Onions, and that's like he only puts up one cartoon a week, and they are amazing. They're like four panels, and they will blow your mind. Um, I only follow like 400-some people on Instagram. 
So if you want to find cartoonists, just go to my the people I follow and go at through. At semi dash rad. Semi underscore rad. Oh, sorry, I'm yeah. just saying dash Doesn't underscore matter. rad. People, people find it. Yeah. I don't know. Is there a semi dash rad? Probably not. The website is. Oh, okay, yeah. got it. There might be. There's a football in New Zealand, like rugby player, and his name is Semi Rad Radra. That's a great name. I know. How, how did you come up with a name, Semi Rad? It's a very smart name for a blog. Well, I was like, at the time, I think uh, I kind of was like, the only story is getting told in the outdoors. To me, it was like people who are really good at stuff. And I was like, there's there's many of us who are not that good. So I was like, well, this is kind of a cool, maybe I'll just tell stories from this perspective. And People that are good, but not pro. Well, people who are having fun. Yeah. But not, yeah, like and none of us are that good. It's like, yeah. you know, those people are like the top 1%, you know, who are, you know, it's like if you're in an ultra marathon, there's like five, maybe 10 people who are going to try to win it. And then there's like a few hundred of us who are just hoping to finish or like do the best we can. And they're normal people with making jokes about gas and yeah, all sorts stuff like of that. bowel movements on the way. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so it's like all of us have some stuff to talk about too. And, um, there was this book that, um, I had seen when I was like 13, it's called semi tough. And it's actually this like really inappropriate fiction book about NFL football. And I never read it. I just remembered the the phrase semi tough. And I was like, what about semi rad? That's cool. It's like not it's, really rad. And it's a great name. I'm, yeah. s- I'm super jealous. Oh, I like thanks. Wanted. Yeah. It's awesome. If I, if I make one great branding move in my entire life, that was probably it, you know, and I'm, I'm done now, I guess. I don't think, I don't think I'll ever succeed in that way again, but it's short. It has a good Twitter handle, you know, and like, because Instagram didn't even exist, I don't think, when I started it. And it's like, it's easy to remember, you know. I'd love to yeah. know a little bit about why you started it. Because before you were you were freelancing, and mm-hmm. I know what it's like to be a freelancer for magazines. It's not the easiest career choice. But you went off and you kind of started your own almost media company, pretty much. Well, okay. yeah. I mean, you can, you can start a media company. You just have to sign up with the Secretary of State for like 50 bucks. And you can be like, I'm a media company, you know? That's true. That's it's, true. And you can be a publishing company today. Right? Pretty easy. For sure. Um, not, not a massive I've achievement. <laughs> who self-publish their books and they're like, I'm a publisher. I'm like, dude, you just like hit print, sent it to Amazon, but good for you. It's super easy. Yeah. It's like, and I, I do a few of those. I'm like, yeah, this is great. I don't need to ask anybody if I can do this. I'm just going to do it and put it out there. Um, but yeah, I was like... Uh, I had written for, I was working at a nonprofit for a long time, Big City Mountaineers, who we oh, used yeah. to, yeah. I know them well. Good for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, from 2008 to 2010. So Big City Mountaineers takes kids. Um, yeah. I can't remember the exact verbiage we were supposed to use at the time, but essentially we take at city risk. kids. City at kids. Ri- Yeah, at risk was one of the, you know, it was like kids who are in after school programs or, or things like that. And we would take them out on their first backpacking trip, not to teach them backpacking, but to show them a new perspective. And it was like... The trips I went on, I would get to go on one every year. It was like the greatest trip of my year every year, you know, even though we only covered like 21 miles over five days or whatever. But as, you know, I wasn't making much money, so I had to try to get, try to make money freelancing. So I was having like very mild success. Like I was writing for the Mountain Gazette, which doesn't exist anymore and paid, I think John was paying me a hundred bucks an article or whatever. And I had done like, maybe I had done one or two Dirtbag Diaries episodes. Nice. But I had seen Fitz Cahal, who started the Dirtbag Diaries, and he was a guy who had had like a decent. I mean, he was also not getting published in a lot of the traditional outdoor magazines. But he just decided he was going to write his stories, read them into a recorder in his closet in Seattle, and put them on the internet. And it just started blowing up. People were like, "This is a cool thing." And, I mean, you can go back and listen to like the early Dirtbag Diaries episodes, I and it's to. it's lo-fi. Uh, the mono board is like one of the, the really early ones. I can't remember the first one I listened to. But anyway, I'd seen him. I'm like, this is, the guy's just doing it. Why don't I just do it too, you know? Like, I could just start my thing. And like, people don't want, you know, if you try to pitch a story to a magazine, you're like, I have this little 500-word blog idea. It'll be funny, you know? And they'll be like, well, okay. You know, they can reject it. You can send it to them. They'll edit it to death. And then it's not funny anymore. And like... I was just like, why don't I just put this out there and see what happens? And so I said, I'm going to do a blog post every week until something happens or I get sick of it. And I haven't got sick of it yet, but it started to take off a little bit at a time over 
you know, probably four months into it, Steve Casimiro from Adventure Journal saw some stuff and he was like, I like this thing you did about, you know, how much beer you should buy somebody for favors they do you for the outdoors. Like, you know, it was like buy somebody a beer if they, if they drive to the trailhead, like you need to buy your friend a beer. If they pull you out of an avalanche, you owe them beer for the rest of their life. You know, I don't even drink beer, but like, yeah. So he reprinted that stuff on Adventure Journal and that started to get me like more of more noticed and just kind of took off from there. I love that this is your kind of motto, it seems like, or, or how you operate. You try something, but you give it a, you know, you try it for a long time. So you develop a habit and you see if it works. And if it sticks, you keep going with it. Yeah. But you show up and you do the work. Well, yeah. I mean, and that comes, I feel like that just comes from like, I'm, I don't know if this is a Midwestern thing. Maybe it's just my family, but it was just like, you just work, you just finish it. You do the work and like, you see people start a blog and be like, they like put up one post and they're like, all right guys, I started a new blog. And they're like, it's like, cool. <laughs> and then they do like six posts in a month. And then it's like, they don't Done. do a post for like six or seven months. And they're like, sorry, I've been really busy. I'm like, every, I'm like, no shit. Everybody's busy. Like, just make the time. Like, do you want to do this or not? And like, People, you know, they ask all these like different technical questions about what should I do? Should I use WordPress? Should I do this? Should I do that? Do you have any tips or tricks on how to like get your stuff noticed? And like, you know, do you have, you know, any hacks you use? Are there, are there techniques? And I'm like, no, you just, just grind. That's what you do. Like you do it until you get noticed or something happens. And then, and then you're a writer, you know, like if you want to write, write, you know. Amen. Best words ever. Well, um, well, hey, I get it. Like, there's this thing called the podcast fade, and it's after seven shows. Most seven. Seven shows, people die. This is like a term. It's the podcast. It's a real thing. Seven shows. Pe- pe- people call me all the time. Shelby, I want to start a podcast. And I was like, yep, do it. You should. If it's hard, be prepared. Show up. Do the work. Se- it's a lot of work. What episode is this? 62 or something like this that? This is going to be like 60-something. Nice. I don't know yeah. exactly. But, but yeah, we're, I'm trying to show up and do the work. I appreciate that you've done the work. It's not easy to do what you do. And it's, I love that you add humor to it, but also I love that you do, you know, you do the things you write about. So I read this story and you quoted Thoreau and you said, how vain it is to sit down and write when you have not stood up to live. And it was a quote when you talked about your kind of approach to writing. Oh yeah. Um, I think when I was like super young, I wanted to write about music and you know, it's really hard to like that, that when I was in grad school, I was like, Oh, I'm going to, you know, someday I'm gonna write for Rolling Stone or Spin or something like that. And uh, I realized like it was really hard to get into music magazines because really who cares what you think, you know, about music when you're nobody. Um, But I found this, you know, like kind of MO where I could just go and do adventures and write about those. And like that was, that's kind of what made, you know, took my, my career take off, you know, which was a way of kind of being like, it's great, you have to, like when you're young you want to write but you don't really know anything but nobody's gonna i mean you know my dad told me that plenty of times so i didn't believe him until you know, like, you well, know. it's true like yeah, these like, great books are wasted on youth you're like, yeah. you don't understand you understand catcher in the rye when you're young but you understand it so much better when you're older yeah for sure and like you have to kind of have some perspective and things to tell stories about so it's great to like go do things and be able to tell those stories as opposed to just like sitting in, you know, an office and thinking or or whatever it is, you know, or looking at the internet. So, you know, if you, if you look at, you know, Instagram is a great example right now, like people who, you know, like van life is like this huge thing now. And it's not like it is this fantasy people have and they're like, this is what I wish I was kind of doing. And in reality, some of these people who are doing it are like, yeah, a lot of people do live in their vans full time, but they're taking like five photos over one day and then posting them over the week. And then maybe they're spending a lot of time in the library in Moab or the, you know, in, in coffee shops, doing some other side work, trying to like make a living, but you are, you are living someone's dream and communicating that. And it's like, it's like this way of taking experience and telling a story about it. And it succeeds because of that. But uh, yeah, I think you have to like go do things in life and have something to tell a story about the thing that, I was in grad school and I took a nonfiction writing workshop at the University of Montana from nice. from Judy Blunt, who is a best selling author. And I was I was at a loss. Like I when I moved to Montana from Iowa, I was meeting all these interesting people and I was just like, I'm just this dumb shit kid from Iowa. Like I don't 
I've never been anywhere. I've never really done anything interesting. And I had to go meet with Judy Blunt, you know, after the first week of classes and talk about what I thought I should write about that semester. And I was like, I don't really have a lot of life experiences like compared to these people in the class. And I was, she's like, well, what'd you do last summer? And I was like, well, I was in rehab and then I spent a week in jail. <laughs> and she goes, well, you should write about those things because most people don't get to go there. And I'm like, yeah, they don't get to, do they? <laughs> they you know? So I wrote an essay about being in jail and I wrote an essay about being in rehab. And those things formed like some of the, it was like some of the earliest stuff I'd written for what became a book 13 years later, you know, like those are literally cut and pasted. And then of course edited several times into the book. And like I workshopped one of those essays in that class and, you know, somebody in the class had said, you know, like your perspective on being in jail, you sound like you think you're better than these people and you're a criminal too. And I'm like, Oh, you're right. I do. Yes. Okay. And that was some of the most valuable editorial guidance. And I was like, yeah, I just need to like, I am exactly like these guys I'm in jail with, you know, even though they like knocked off a car wash, like, you know, robbed, you know, a cash machine, like the weird things that they had done. All I had done was drive drunk again. And like, it was like, no, you're totally a criminal too. And so it was super valuable in that way. But it was like, it was her saying the stuff you have done is worth telling stories about, you know, but you do have to do things, you know, you can't just be like going through life and scrolling on your cell phone, like, and being like, oh, I'll be inspired, you know, it doesn't work, I don't think. That's awesome advice. Um, go out and do things if you're listening to this podcast. After we're done, go out and maybe don't go to jail, don't drive drunk, go do something positive in the world. And with that, I think we should take a break from and hear from our sponsor, who Brendan knows really well. Yes, buy all your gear at REI. This episode was brought to you by REI Co-op, a brand that's big on protecting where we play outside. As stewards of the outdoors, REI gives away 70% of all profits back to the outdoors. Since 1976, REI has invested more than $77 million through partner nonprofits to create, improve, and sustain access for all to inspiring outdoor places. They're also incredibly eco-friendly. REI uses 100% renewable energy to operate, and they built the first largest and most sustainable net zero energy and LED platinum distribution center in the country. On top of that, REI has partnered with over 66 brands in the outdoor industry to enhance the sustainability of their products. Their motto, a life outdoors is a life well lived, is something I definitely stand by. You can learn more, take classes, go on experiences, find a store near you, and get the gear you want to get outside at REI.com. Brendan, actually, you, your first job, one of your first jobs was at REI, I read. Yeah, I, uh... I, so I got out of grad school and moved to Phoenix, uh, and I could not get a job at a newspaper. I was applying at every single newspaper and was getting a little bit of like, oh, well, we'll call you in three months or whatever. And nobody wants to hire somebody who has a, gra- a master's degree and no experience, which is not shocking. So I went to REI and applied for a job there, and I talked my way into a sales job, and uh, it was the, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was like... I started working there, met people who were into climbing. They took me climbing. I hated it. Uh, they're gr- great, great friends now, though. Like um, You love climbing now, though. Yeah, I, I, I think I'm a slow learner, and I, they were teaching me, trying to teach me everything, and I was just not, not really listening that well. And uh, it took like a year later when I moved to Colorado. But, um, yeah, I actually was... It was great. I I got the job there and I worked there for like three or four months and then I got a newspaper job, but I held on to the REI job because it was like my social life. So it was like work here one night a week plus one day on the weekends. And, you know, that was that was me hanging out with people and getting to like talk to people who came in. And it was the coolest thing about it was not talking to people about gear. It was like saying, what are you going to do with this thing? And they were like, well, I got this idea. I'm going to go take this trip. And I was like, making these mental notes of like, I should go do that someday, you know, and that's still, still checking some of those things off that you just talk to customers about like, wow, that sounds really cool, you know? And 
Yeah, I did a book signing at that store oh, cool. uh, two Came two Octobers circle. ago. Yeah, and like Fun. two of the guys I worked with, or three of the guys I worked with showed up, and I was staying with one of them when I was down there, my friend Bruce, and we got to go out to dinner afterwards. It was so, it was so cool. It was just like, wow, this place was really small. They got rid of the climbing wall too, you know? <laughs> so like, cool. So you told me that you camp like 30 days a year. Do you still do that? That's amazing. I, I did not last year, but I tried to for... Pretty much every, I think I was just like working at this, working at the nonprofit and we did have a pretty generous like vacation policy. The company just shut down for three weeks a year, but like three one week periods and that you were not allowed to come into the office. Um, I'm not sure if they still do it, but it was cool. So I was able to take like a road trip every, I mean, I had no money because I was working at a nonprofit. nonprofit. <laughs> like I literally had a graduate degree and I saw, I was working at a newspaper and saw that um, my buddy sent me a, a job listing on Craigslist and was like, you might be interested in this nonprofit. They're hiring somebody for 12 bucks an hour. And I was like, great. You know, I got like $54,000 in student loans for journalism and I'm going to go essentially be like somebody's assistant. Anyway, they had a great vacation policy. So I was able to like go take trips to the desert and stuff. And I started stacking up all these nights of camping. And I was like, this is great. I'm gonna try to get a month every year. Like what a good goal that is. And we would, you know, take a big trip where you'd knock off like seven days and then I'd go on a backpacking trip in the summer with the kids from the nonprofit and it's like five more days. And then we would do, we would do this thing where we left the, this park in Capitol Hill uh, in Denver at like, we'd all meet at like 6 p.m. on a summer night on a weeknight and we'd drag all this camping stuff 12 miles down the bike path to the state park down there and we would camp, you know, like we would have like baby trailers full of firewood and like people would bring tons of food and we would camp on a Thursday night and then we'd all get up at like 6 a.m. the next morning and bike back into town and go to work and it was like all right that's another night you know how fun it was super cool yeah Um, any any tips on like best things you always take with you camping hmm always always camp like backpacking camping or car camping or both anything just to take in the wilderness what do you always have on hand I always have, uh, I always have a headlamp and I always have extra batteries for my headlamp stored inside another headlamp, which is, which is a trick. I used to do these conference calls with the big city mountaineers where we'd, it was, I was on the phone with guide services and talking to them about our, our clients, our, uh, climbers who are doing fundraising climbs for them. And they would always give tips. And one of them said, best place to store, uh, batteries for your headlamp is in another headlamp. So I've always had a small headlamp. Good that advice. I always take a space blanket um, for almost everything, uh, unless I'm just trail running near town. Uh, I've never spent the night out unplanned, but I think that helps. To be honest with you, like taking an iPhone on a camping and backpacking trip is like one of the best pieces of outdoor equipment that has, you know, happened to us in the last decade. Like, I use it for, you know, it's a flashlight in limited doses. It'll crush your battery if you try to use it. But, like, that's a backup headlamp as well. You know, if you're really in a bind, I listen to music. I take notes on my phone. If I'm on a trip where I'm supposed to be writing something, I will type in the note yeah. notepad notes yeah. feature. I'll type notes for a story in there. Um, I use a GPS program or a GPS app. You know, you download maps offline and then you can it works as a gps and it doesn't use a ton of battery i did a trip a few years ago where a magazine asked me to take a gps on the trip and they were like i was like i don't own one i've never used one they're like well you can take the one we have in the office and the lady sent it to me and the editor sent it to me and she was like it uses about two double a batteries every day when it's on i'm like are you shitting me we're gonna be out here for 10 days so i'm like oh my god so i had like i you know you're like cutting your toothbrush and have to save weight and then you have to carry like Batteries. Yeah, it was miserable. And then, you know, later, because they wanted us to have a GPS track of our route, which is, it's great, but like not worth the wait. But now you have a phone and you're like, I don't do a lot of trips where I'm like totally looking down at a GPS to navigate, but you can use it. And it's like, the app is like 25 bucks and like, it's yeah. great. So there's that. And I think, is that all the apps I use? But it's a really cool tool, you that, know? That's really good advice. What yeah. about your favorite meal to eat? cook camping to impress someone oh i don't think they might uh i did this like pesto pasta recipe that i that i make but it's super simple we we have a 
my friend and I, my friend Anna and I wrote a cookbook that came out last year called Best Served Wild. She was most of the cooking knowledge. You have a lot of books. You have Best Served Wild. You have the, the Outdoor Guide. The Great Outdoors, the User's Guide, yeah. The Great Outdoors, the User's Guide, which has tips on everything from how to go to the bathroom in the wild, yeah. how to have sex in your sleeping bag or not. It's, it's really oh, actually does, yeah. informative, yeah. like what, what types of rock climbing... Yeah. Um, it's not really how to have sex. Are, I think I think the, it's not how to have sex. You said you actually. I think that prefaced, was like we assume you know how to have sex. Yeah, Here's how you do it in the outdoors and be comfortable. It, you yes. prefaced it with we assume you know how. Uh, yeah. I like that. It's full of good humor pieces too. I don't know that one just stuck out because I thought it was so funny. They, um, I think somebody suggested we do that. I was what, like, okay. Fine. What to do when you see a bear? Um, it's great. Yeah. So you have that book, and then the, the book you wrote that's kind of your memoir. What's that called? Sixty meters to anywhere. Sixty yeah. meters to anywhere. Yeah, I always say I'm like one of them's going to take off one of these days, and I won't have to work as hard. I won't have to keep writing so many books. Buy these books. We're going to link to them in the show notes. Or you can just send me a check if you would like. That's actually a much faster way for me (laughs) to achieve my dreams, and you don't have to do all the reading. Did you self-publish any of these? Yes. Okay. So I self-published one called the New American Road Trip Mixtape in 2013. That was kind of like the first book I put out, and um. I'm not in love with it anywhere. I'm like, God, oh, God, this is, you know, it's like you hate all your work a year after it comes out. You're like, guys, put a piece of garbage, you know, but I just did a book signing in Jackson Hole and uh, a young lady brought that book up and was like, will you sign this? This is my favorite book ever. And I'm like, what? Like, it's not even my favorite book ever. And, but it's flattering that people are reading it and you're like, oh, that's so cool. That's, that that's somebody's favorite. Really but, cool. And it's cool that you just keep writing. Um, yeah. You have... um book you're working on right now can you talk a little bit about that yeah we're doing we don't have a title for it but um my friend Forrest Woodward and I are gonna it's sort of a I'm not supposed to use the word coffee table book I don't think but it's like basically it's gonna photo be a book yeah it's gonna be like a photo heavy book on all the different ways people camp so it's kind of like great. there's a book called cabin porn out there it's like just yep. great photos of cabins and all over the place and that's what we're kind of kind of do with uh with camping we're you know dig snow cave sleep on a porta ledge in zion kayaking wow. bike touring yeah so it's like i literally get to spend like 70 days in the field this year with friends like goofing off and your year sounds so fun and someone's paying you to do this well i had to do all the work of planning it so it's this huge pain in the ass and now i'm just going to drink coffee and hand forest lenses and be like okay so awesome no it'll be it'll be great i'm stoked Good for you. Um, that's that's kind of a lesson in creating your own destiny and creating your own year. It's really cool. So you do the work, and then you get to do 70 days in the outdoors having fun with your friend. Just like that. Just like just, that. Just like 13 years later, you know, boom. <laughs> like you too can succeed. All right, so we ask all of our, our guests this, you know, advice you'd give to your 15-year-old self knowing what you know now. Can people tell 15-year-olds anything? Like, really? Like, are you really listening? You know what I mean? Uh, uh, Yeah, to some people I'd listen. But that was the hardest year for me, being a sophomore in high school. Oh, it sucks. Kids are, yeah, it was hard. Like, my friends were doing drugs, and I knew drugs were bad, so I didn't do them, but I really wanted to. So then I I did drugs later. No, I actually never did. I was always too scared. Um, My mom works in addiction prevention. Oh, yeah. We, We already have, you know, people who are addicted to drugs in my family, so I never did them. But, you know, other things I did, so it's it's okay. Um, But any advice you'd give to your 15 year old self? You know, I think like, yeah, I think like people, I think when you're 15, you think high school is like, like that's the biggest thing in your life. And you just like, I had no vision beyond that. And I think one of the things that probably would have helped is like, look, there's a whole world out there and like, this is nothing, you know, like this does not matter. Like in 10 years, you will not care what happened in high school. Um, Cause I think a lot of people have a hard time with it, have a really hard time with it. And like, you know, kids are like committing suicide or like really miserable in high school and it informs some of the ways they live after that. And it was just like, God, I think sometimes I'm like, God, how miserable I was in high school. Like, oh my God, things that happened to me, the way my life went after that was like, it is so tiny of a part of an experience for me. Like it does not matter. And I think I would advise myself that like, it's going to be okay. There's a lot of cool stuff out there. Um, I love that. But I also was like being coached to like, not being coached, but where I came from, we didn't have like, you know, it's a really small town in Iowa. And, you know, if I had said to my high school guidance counselor when I met with him, like my senior year where he's like, 
you're kind of deciding where to apply to college. And, you know, you're essentially asking a 17 year old, what do you want to do with the rest of your life? But all they know was like jobs. It was like, you could do this. You could go into marketing. You could go into accounting. You could be a teacher. You know, nobody was, if I had said, I want to be an adventure writer, Wendell Hurst, my high school guidance counselor would have been like, okay, I don't actually know that that's a job. I don't know that you can do that for money. And, but I had to like go out and see the world in a very, and it took me a long, long time to get there to like figure out that you can do freelance, you know, but you know, that's an option, dude. You don't have to like, I just found my mom actually like her Christmas gift to me this year was uh, like some of my old school papers that she found. She just like wrapped them up and put them up. She was like cleaning the house. And anyway, I was like, oh yeah, I was going to try to be an optometrist. Like, like when I was 18, I thought that was going to be a good idea because my friend's dad was an optometrist and they were like, they had a, you know, good bit of money. And I was like, well, that looks cool. I'll just do that. He's, what's he do all day? Just looks at people's eyeballs. I could be, I could do that. And you're like, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm not an optometrist. You know, <laughs> no offense to Dr. Uglum, my, my friend's dad, but like, this was way more fun, I think for me personally. That's so awesome. I yeah. actually did go to my counselor in college and said, I just want to be an adventure writer. How'd that go? Um, my, my journalism magazine professor said, you'll never make it as a freelance writer. And then I was like, okay, you're on. And he ruined me because if you tell me something that I can't do, then I'm going to do it. And so for the next 10 years, I was like, I'm just going to be a freelance magazine writer and prove this dude wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, like, so teachers shouldn't do that. Have you, um, seen the, have you seen the film Do What You Can't? No. Casey Neistat. It's on YouTube. It's like six minutes and it's great. It's just all about like creating your own thing, you know, and it's, okay. it's about him he actually calls out his like high school principal. Like he told me I was going to be anything. And they're like, I think they show a photo of the guy. And we did that in, in the film. I don't know if it's going to make the final credits or not, but um, I just wrote into the credits. My friend Jason's part of the film is his high school guidance counselor telling him that college is not for people like him, quote unquote, you know, and, and Jason of course does not take that advice. And we, we were doing the special thanks section of the credits and I, I'm handwriting all of them. And I'm like, texted Jason. I'm like, do you want to thank your high school guidance counselor? And he's like, oh, sure. And I'm like, okay. I just wrote his name in there. Well, it's crazy how influential those people can be in your life. Because I actually had tons of people that were super positive and encouraged me my whole life. And then the one guy who didn't, I was like, oh, bring it. You never know. Like, maybe he's just having a bad day. Yeah, but like, he, he was, just offhand. He was right. He was just like, it's really hard to make a living being a freelance magazine writer. And you know what? The guy was totally right. So um, it's not an easy way to yeah, make well, a living. Yeah, well, whatever. Big middle finger to that guy. Yeah. I'm making it. Um, you're making it. I love oh, it. No, I'm saying you are. No, I'm kind you're of making right. it. I don't know. Um, I love this, what I do right now. Um, you've got, you've done the van life and let's say you have to paint one message on a van for the world to see. What would that message be? Or would it be a cartoon? Oh boy. I mean, uh, this is like that, the Tim Ferriss question, right? With the billboard. What I would just you put completely the ripped off Tim Ferriss no, and okay. asked a different question. No, it's like, Thank you, Tim. Well, like the van life thing is like, I just, I would think, it, I think I would paint, it's not what you think, you know? Because I think people think it's like, oh, it's like a girl in a bikini looking out the back window of, a VW van and it's just like paradise. And I'm like, if you point that camera the other way and look out the windshield, it's probably not what you think it is. I mean, we were like, my girlfriend and I were living in there for a year and a half in an Astro van and we didn't really, we couldn't really cook inside the van. And it was just like, you couldn't even sit up. It was just like, it's fun. You know, it's great to like see sunsets and sunrises from a van and see the West and stuff, but it's not that it's not paradise, you know, but I think to a lot of people, you know, if you're working a job and you like get two or three weeks of vacation a year, that looks pretty awesome. And it's like, it's a trade off for sure. But you I know, love that. It's yeah. such good. That's so, so true. Um, Everybody should do it. I'm, I'm really <laughs> glad I got to do it. I'm just, I'm super glad I'm not doing it right now. I'm like, yeah. I'm so stoked on my toaster at home. Oh, yeah. Too. Me too. I love having an oven. Any advice to those who want to make a living following their passion? Um, it's probably way more work than you think it is. And it's probably it's probably going to take a lot longer than you think it will. You know, there's, it, it doesn't happen fast for most people. And I think when you look at people who are successful, you are seeing them at one moment in their career, you know, like for every, you know, photographer you follow and you think, oh my gosh, that person is like, 
they're so successful. Yeah, they spent like years learning how to take photos and like they sucked for a long time probably, you know, and don't, if you want to do it, people always ask like, what's it like, what's a tip? And I was like, yeah, if you don't have drive, you are not going to make it, you know, people may make it look easy because after a while it gets easier, but for the most part, you have to deal with rejection. There's a lot of people, a lot of ways that you can get shut down and most people get shut down. Like the probably 95% of people get shut down and the rest of the people who you think are successful just would not give up. And that's more important than talent. That's more important than any leg up you get from anybody. You know, I think a lot of su- people who are way more successful than me would say the same thing. Brendan, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure having you on. Thanks for having me. Find him at at semirad on Instagram, semi-rad.com on the web. And we'll link to where to find his books. Thank you to Brendan for meeting me in the podcast room of the Outdoor Retailer Show in Denver to do this episode Definitely check out his books. We'll have links in all the show notes on the website. Just go to wildideasworthliving.com. And while you're there, write a review on iTunes. That really is what makes this show grow. I'd love to get 30 reviews just from this show. So if you can make it happen and be one of those 30, I will be greatly appreciative of you. Here's one from Om Sand and Honey. I believe that my listeners of this show have the best names on iTunes. Love this podcast. As a gal who's always looking for inspiration to get outside and live my best life, this podcast is the jam. So thank you. There was another one by Acoustic Dead who wrote, an eclectic topic variation makes this podcast outstanding. Shelby has a real calm demeanor about her that makes the interviews flow and topics pop. Kudos. I don't think he knows me. No, just kidding. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Acoustic Dead and to Ohm, Sand, and Honey and more for writing reviews on iTunes. REI, thank you for not only sponsoring Brennan, for sponsoring this show. We greatly appreciate it. Go to REI or REI.com. Check them out. Get your gear there. And wherever you are listening to this show, don't forget, Some of the best adventures often happen when you follow your wildest ideas. We'll see you next week.